Hi folks, welcome to today's webinar. Um, today we're going to focus on our front rows um, and we've got a great lineup um, of presenters and insights to keep you interested the whole way through it. A little bit of housekeeping beforehand, I suppose my name is Colin Finnegan, I'm the Children and Youth Development Manager with Irish Rugby. Noticing and wondering is the key part of what we're actually talking about here today. So we want you to notice, to learn more about how to actually watch rugby and then to wonder and have some more questions going about actually what you could do to improve your own position, to improve your own development in this time. It's a tough time for everyone, but it's also going to be a hugely exciting time when we get back onto pitch now before the end of the season. And I know there's a lot of provincial administrators who are working very hard to ensure that that happens and that there's an opportunity for everyone to get out and, and to play rugby. Without further ado, we're going to go straight into our player insights. Um, we've got two player insights today, which is uh, fantastic. Um, First up, we're going to have a, a little video clip from Marcus Hannon, who has came up through the club scene with Clain RFC and, and is now with Leinster Sub Academy and, and has played Ireland through the youth section as well. Um, and, and Marcus is going to go and answer a couple of questions around what has he noticed in his own game? What does he do to improve his own game? And, and is there any examples, I suppose, of, of how he's actually developed? Firstly, how do you use analysis to improve your own game? Um, in the lead up to a game, you get the scout of an opposition. So their last two, three games sent out to you and in team meetings, unit meetings, you'll go through the footage, but then in your own time, it's the you onus know, is kind of on you to go through position specific areas. So the likes to that, I'll just look at the line out, look at the scrums, look at how the tight five set up in the scrums, look at how the tight head, uh, what trends he likes to use. So if he um, is attacking that scene between the loose head and the hooker, whether he uh, likes to deal out a lot of his weight at, on the on the bind. Um, and then that just brings me on to the next question, actually. Are there any examples where you've seen something yourself that you've managed to implement um, on that bind? I'm working with the flankers. So I'm getting them to hold me back a bit more. Um, so that allows me to just keep my weight on the front foot, on the balls of my feet. Um, and then I can battle for that head space with the tight head and even try and deload a lot of my weight onto him, trying to open up his chest and um, keeping my right shoulder through, sinking that inside knee and then hopefully getting under him a bit more. And then myself and the hooker can go at him and it makes it just a bit easier. Look, we're very lucky now here, um, I was going to say in the studio, but um, coming direct from our home, uh, we, we've got Chloe Pierce. So Chloe obviously plays with UL Bowes, has represented Munster and Ireland. And um, we're, we're going to go pick your brains for, for a minute now, Chloe. How's things? Hi, Colm. How are you on muted there? Sorry. I knew I'd no, make no, that mistake. Um, no, thanks no, for having me on. Much. I'm looking forward to it. Brilliant, brilliant. Great to have you. Look, as I say, we'll get straight into it. Um, so I suppose, how do you watch games to improve your own game? And and look, when you're when you're watching those games, you know, is there anything you, you've noticed um, that will help you improve that? Yeah, so I suppose just like with Ireland, like we get a lot of footage and, you know, it's very well broken down then. Um, different angles of the scrum, different, you know, top angle, side angle, but like bringing it back for people watching at home. I suppose all you kind of have is your pause, your rewind if you're watching it on the telly. So scrum specific, you know, we don't have the luxury of drawing what angles they're at, drawing knee, hip, shin parallel angles. But I suppose the easiest way that I would do it would be to kind of work backwards from the scrum. So assuming referee gives the right call, Andy is given a penalty, Luke said coming around the corner, you know, then I'd probably go back from them and have a look like what did that loose head do to get into that position? What was their setup like? What was their bind like? Similarly, then decision goes the other way, tight head goes off their feet, you know, and he's given that decision. Go back to look at their foot placement. What way did they set up? Like, did they get too long then on the set? Like, did they chase their feet? Is that why the pressure then came that they ended up going down? Um, like, it's very hard to kind of quantify force by just watching it on the telly. But like little cues you might pick up on, like binds or even foot placement. Are they too wide? Next minute, loose heads hips, um, you know, kick out and flanker doesn't drive him back in and penalty goes the other way but um, around the pitch then just looking at work rate really how do they get into position early you know what kind of cheat lines are props taken because the last thing you want to do is run an extra 40 meters when you can take that nice quick line up the middle maybe 
get a nice tip on and you're in under then, but um, just kind of playing working clever as opposed to just working hard. You know, there's a lot of ways props are kind of doing that these days and it's it's good to see as well and trying to bring it into my own game then. Yeah, no, look, that's, that's a fantastic insight there. And, you know, I suppose it elicits a lot of images like front row play is one of the most cerebral positions now because there's that much going on there's there's that many things that I, quantifying force was, was one of the, the the phrases you use there and um you know it it is it, it's really at the coal face but there's so much that go, technical that goes into it chloe thanks a million for your insights there and, and what we'll do is um we'll come back to you with a question later on in our questions and answer session um folks just feel free to get your questions in there we will try and get to some of them later on and uh, at the end of the pre presentation. Uh, now we're going to move swiftly on. Andy, in, in what Chloe was saying, there was given an awful lot of penalties, um, but we'll, we'll go to, to him now for a wee bit of an insight and in what he looks for as a referee in front row play. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Um, so yeah, obviously, as Chloe's alluded to, guys, there's, um, there's a lot of moving parts from a, from a referee inspect perspective of what you're looking at if we look at say set piece. So if we just look at scrum to begin with, um, there's, there's probably one thing that I really, really focus on and that's to, to get the setup right. Because if you don't get the setup right, then you're going to be, you're going to create problems then for the rest of the game. So you obviously want to try and get buy-in, player buy-in with regards to that. And, and that comes to a, a few things in terms of just your cadence, first of all, being really, really slow. So you're not rushed and then the players are off balance then and and, it, and, and you're unstable through those calls. So um, there was a phrase that I think Rob Penny used a few years ago. If you feel like you're at the edge of the cliff and you're falling off, well, then you're not balanced. So it's important then from a refereeing perspective that you're not too rushed. So the players will be off balance, but also you're not too slow either because then players will, will tire and then they will fall over that edge of the cliff. So it's just to try and get that happy medium. Um, just in terms of a couple of things, then we, when we get it through the setup, um, there's one key thing for me is just around trying to maintain that discipline on the buying phase. Um, I know Chloe alluded to it there, but what I'm looking for as a referee is because there's so many moving parts, as we say, that we're trying to win that hit, initial hit. So if that one team is being passive uh, and pulling back or the other team is going forward, then you're going to have problems again at that setup. So it's really, really important that you try and get that buy-in on the setup. And then once we get that stability that you probably hear a lot uh, um, in every game that referees talk about, once we get that stable platform, then we can get the ball into the scrum. Um, and just in terms of then that post set, then once the ball is feeded, there's a few things there that we'll be looking at. And there's a at times, you probably look at, if we look at a professional game's point of view from the TV perspective, you see on replays that sometimes our referees have gone after the loose head or the tight head. And from our perspective, is I, I think the guys like Nagsy will probably allude to now in a minute, is you've got to get first things first, is that, that tight head's got to be set up straight and you've got to get feet strong underneath him and, or her. So um, there's no point that we go after the loose head if you didn't get first things first and getting that tight head straight. So... Um, that's what I would look for. So tight head, feet strong, set up straight, then I can move to the loose head. But if I'm going after the loose head, then I haven't got the first things first. So, so there's a few things. You Sometimes you might see that the tight head is overextended, feet are too long. But now I have to weigh up of whether that was caused by the tight head being too overextended or whether the loose head has pulled the tight head in, hinging down and caused the tight head to overextend. So Again, there's a couple of moving parts and there's so many other different things. You, I know you'd all agree that the, the feed probably hasn't been refereed. So now you're looking at that and back rows binding and eight changing. So there's so many moving parts all the time. So just, yeah. ju just away from the scrum as well then, Colm, just around line out more, just to touch briefly on that. So what I what myself and an AR would be looking at in a professional game is um, that the support lifters are not throwing the jumper across. So we want obviously a straight lift up and down, not thrown across to interfere with that line out mall setup, but also that the support lifter doesn't come around the jumper and uh, and, and we have an illegal formation then at the mall. So there's a couple of things there you get to post mall setup then is around pulling players out of the mall and collapsing, um, but they would be the main kind of key focus areas that we'd be looking at. Brilliant. And look, 
you know, it, it just goes again to reinforce w- w- how technical a position, you know, the, the front row is and uh, and all of the different components that, that go into it. And, and I'm sure, you know, we could we could talk for hours and hours. And that leads me on nicely to, to our next two presenters, uh, Ken Nags and Connor Gavin. So Ken Ken's a, a scrum coach and he's a CRO for Leinster Rugby. And Connor's a CDO with, uh, w- with Connacht Rugby and also a scrum coach there. The guys are going to bring you through a bit of a presentation and g- give you a chance to kind of notice and wonder um, and, and try and hopefully elicit a few more questions from you and, and give you a chance to maybe take in some of the key pointers that, that the guys feel happens in the front row. So uh, I'll hand over to you guys now. Cheers, Carl. <clears throat> did you, did you just get this presentation up here. Yeah, so as I suppose the, the guys have touched on an awful lot that's going to come through this presentation. Sorry, guys, Ken Nags here, not 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 Connor. So but the between Chloe, Marcus and Andy, we've touched on an awful lot that's going to come up along this presentation. So we'll just get straight into it there. So just in terms of Andy exactly just talking about that 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 setup to start. So if we look at just individual setups for front rows, as we can see here. We have that kind of square, square uh, setup with feet um, just balanced 50-50. I suppose this would be generally at a, a younger age group. Just uh, it's just more natural for them to start that way. Whereas if we go this more heel toe, again, it's probably further up the age groups heading into the pro game. So again, this all assists with balance. And if we just have a look at the last one here, this is a hooker. That hooker setup. Again, it's vital that we're balanced. As I say here, the, the this weight distribution depends on on position. And if we just look at this this position here, this that uh, Barry Gray is in, we can relate that to an awful lot more of our rugby, not just not just scrum. If we think of heading in, just getting set for a tackle, approaching a breakdown, move, going for a lift in the line out. So there's. Again, this kind of setup, knowing what it's like, transfers across across our game, not just not just the scrum. So if we just look at that setup then, as Andy was talking about. If we just look, the main I suppose the main connections on our binds is the front row, our hips and sh- shoulders and hips, and we can see here that the hand placements that kind of refers to hookers. You have to keep your hooker happy because at the end of the day they're going to be running the scrum. So if we can get our shoulders through, again referees, Andy, probably one thing they'd be looking for at all levels of the game is that shoulder through. It doesn't necessarily happen all the time. And again, if we just look at the binds here, if you just take note of the lads binds here, these are sub academy, Leinster sub academy players. So if we just have, just take note of the way the props are binding onto the hooker, because as we move through the presentation, there'll be there'll be different variations on it. So just have a couple of clips here. Uh, da, 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 da. Get rid of the sound. So as ex- exactly what Andy was saying there about balance. We need to be balanced across the board in the scrum. Everybody is responsible for their own weight, so their own balance. So if we have second rows, just pushing into front rows, that's going to put us off, be all unbalanced. And if you just take a look here at the props feet, that kind of split stance, it'll kind of relate back to the, the previous slide there. So we just play through here. So this is Ireland against Italy in a lovely empty stadium. So if we just watch getting strong on the bind, it's exactly what Andy was saying. And then we just drop in. So if we just hold it here, if we just have a look again, this is the top end of the game. I don't think we'll find too many under 16 sc- uh, scrummaging at this height. So again, everything's going to be relative. Probably an underage game, feet will be a lot further on, scrum will be a little bit higher. But if we just look, Chloe mentioned that kind of that, that, that kind of hip, knee angle, shoulder. So we can just follow that line. That's what we're kind of looking for. So bend the knee up to the hips and that flat back, especially for the, un- the younger age groups. That's exactly what we'd be looking for is that flat back just in terms of safety. Uh, so we we'll just play it on there a little bit. 
So Port probably got a little bit extended on that, but good shove from the lads in all eight, got them into that, back into that strong position. I don't know, Andy might have something to say about the bind here, but generally it's kind of bind where we can. Ideally long, but we, we bind where we can. We drive on through. This is second set up here. It's another scum against Italy. But if you just take a look at what's happening in this area here, again, it's vital that we let our second rows in and keep our balance. So if you just take a look at what uh, Porter does here to allow James Ryan in, it's again it's probably very handy for uh, for players across the board. So he gets his foot set, rolls that knee, second rows are in. We're all good. And just on, I suppose, kind of the, uh, I suppose it's, it's not really a new team, but if we just have a look at the Italian second rows here, starting on both knees where the Irish second rows don't. It's just, I suppose, it helps with balance and stability. I know Leinster have adopted it recently. So we just, we just play on that video. Fine, getting the feet back, dropping in, nice strong. Probably a touch overextended there, but again, lovely body height, good strength through, and drives on. So we just looked, that was tight head side, so now we just look at Keen Healy on the loose head. Again, looking at that, nice angle here, strong position. Again, tight head pointed on him, over the shoulder. But again, we're just, we're just looking for this consistent kind of shape. And it's, it's, it's consistent throughout the scrum, really, with slight variations. But it's, uh, that's our power position, again, if we're in the gym squat. So there we go. It's just another clip here. Just around the importance of kind of staying in that fight. Just take it just for our hookers. We just take it back here. We not too far back. What do we notice here between Conor Murray's legs? Is uh, Rob Herring's foot up ready for the strike? So that's I suppose that's a key element. I suppose is that communication between nine hooker. So we know when that ball is coming in. The Italian nine is uh, doing a bit of mess and wouldn't be like scrum halves to be doing that. But uh, just see, in foot up, nice clean strike. Gets a little bit messy there, but as I say, but talk about staying in the fight is probably it's probably one of these things that makes it makes it different. The front rows for starters were the only were the only position really in rugby on a pitch that go head to head. So it's just a little bit of ignorance staying in. So if we just look here again, if we notice the difference on the tie head bind on our hooker here. And the way the French do it, it's just a little bit different. Again, as Andy was saying, we're looking for that tie head to be nice and square. But again, it doesn't happen all the time. But just if we just take a notice of the binds, just slightly different. Again, Rob Her Herring is a bit more of a W, where the French are straight across as a T. So we just have a look at it here. Again, just as hookers, if we look at this, this compared to the next clip on a clean strike, straight to CJ's feet, he can organise himself and we're gone. We're gone to play. If we compare it to this clip, again, it's probably it's not the hookers, it's not the hookers' fault. It's just the need to be important that channel is clear so we don't end up in a little bit of a fight like this. So I suppose that's something for the second one to be conscious of. So we're just moving on. If we just move on, again, all the props, the front rows. It's not all about pushing and shoving. So there's just a few clips here of of the rest, the rest of our game, catch, pass, decision making, footwork, and there is we touch on a little bit of power. So we just play this through. If we can watch through, tight furlong, nice flat change of pace, gone to. Decision, I suppose, could have been a, a little bit better, but he wins it back. Ireland are on the front foot. This carry. One, two beaten, three beaten, or 
and just the fight. It's just that that go forward, that intent part of her game. Again, other side of it, defense tackles. First up, making tackle on full back. Being smart around the corners here, putting pressure on nines. Nice turnover and just slow motion if anybody missed it. Thing of beauty, tight head charging it down. The most beautiful part of this clip is coming up next. Andrew Porter carrying. Again, if you just take it back, see the play, other players have played. Porter sees, sees that, that space, steps, power down, poor little winger gets sat down, and that decision then to give the pass at the right time. So it all comes into our game. Again, we're not just, we're just not there for pushing and shoving. So if we just want to take a quick look at hookers here, these videos are going to be continuously on loop. So if you just want to concentrate on one, so we're just look, if you just take a look at stance, James Tracy is square, ball starts overhead. When we compare to, I think it's a burn monster, split stance, ball behind the head, and the throw. Two very good throws. Again, there's uh, variations on it, but I suppose it's the end result is the main thing. But the bits between the hip and the, and the up is the, the bit, nice and tight through the core, elbows, elbows in, follow through when we release on it. And then we just follow it through. So that's a little bit on the hook. So it's it's what I suppose it's what what you're comfortable with and what works for you is the is the key. It's it doesn't have to be one way or the other. So that's just a little bit on the hooker's throw. Just a couple of little reduced exercises. That's my good self in the back garden uh, in the summer. So we just play through. This is just this is just getting into that profile. So the little individual work on that we can do. So just get into that good profile. We can go through it in our heads then about crouch, bind, feedback, dropping into it. So if, again, if you think back to those videos that we watched, flat-ish back, get nice and strong, head and neck in neutral where we want to be. So that's where we're going to be strongest. And then we can just walk it on in bear crawls. Again, this is stuff we can be doing as players. We can coaches can can have a look at players through training when we get back on the pitch so it's just about controlling everything getting forward transferring that way through this this is a is a kind of an exercise doing trees again it's about that good that good profile position that we can we feel what it's like nice tight core and that communication that we need to work it as we do in the front row and then just as a little uh, progression all this stuff can be kind of done i know current climate is probably a little bit difficult so we won't be doing it in trees but if you imagine you're at home if if you have stairs at home you can lean in against the second or third step look and feel what it's like to be in that good profile you could ask somebody 95 percent of can phones have cameras on it take a picture video you in that profile so you can watch back and that's where we can work through then. You can see if our hips are low, if our chest is high, if we're extended through the knees. So it's just a little bit of work on that we can do at home while we're waiting to get back into training. So let's just say, this one now is just, the little progression here is lifting opposites off, left foot, right hand. Again, just really work that core so you know, because it's probably one of the most important aspects of of uh, a front row is core, despite despite appearances at times. So, Collie, that's that's me. I'll hand you over to Connor there now. So, if Connor wants to take over, thanks, Ken. Great stuff. Um, just while Connor's getting up there, just to to remind you, okay, a lot of information coming in there. So, you know, this is being recorded and you will have an opportunity to get those recordings after the event. OK, hi, guys, um, I hope you can I hope you can see my um, video up here. I'm just going to skip through a little bit. I'm just conscious of time just for just to, to get to half three or half one, I should say. So we're just going to have a look at a, a couple of um, couple of little quick little clips, guys. 
Um, my part of it is is probably the exciting part for me is is the looking at you know um, what we're doing outside of our primary job that Ken was touching on. So Ken talked a lot about our, our primary jobs of scrummaging and line out and you know the massive efforts that go in there. But what we're going to look at, and I suppose the challenge for us lads and, and the, the, the words that I took was the notice. So we're going to try and notice the behaviours of players, what they're doing to give themselves the best chance to be effective and dynamic front row players as you know yourself now are massive parts of the massive um i suppose influencers in games and probably in, in the old days there were it was a case of sticking to scrummage in the lineup but we're going to look at maybe the things that they do that we don't always see that they that they do to make themselves effective so if we talk about leinster we're going to look at Keen healy a couple times but if, if we look at leinster and we talk about their line speed why are leinster able to bring such good line speed and what we're going to look at we're going to concentrate on healy here so you won't see it quite there, guys, but as we slow it down, let's just watch Healy. He just rolls out of that scrum, okay, and he's on the move early. He's aware of his game, and let's just watch him here now. Watch how he looks up and he scans once. He's sideways on moving, which allows him to be square. He's communicating with the player beside him. He scans again, and this gives him a chance to get off the line. So when we hear commentators and we hear people talking about Leinster's line speed, what well, our challenge for us as players now is can we wonder and can we notice what are the players' habits, you know, in the background? What are these players doing? What are their little cheat lines to get into position that bit earlier? How are they saving energy? And how are some players more effective than others? So if we watch that Healy clip, that's one example of them there getting into position. So the line speed was the result, but all those little factors kind of came beforehand. So if we go on to the next clip, Again, we're going to look here at Leinster and attack this time. Again, Healy's on the loose head, okay? And we're just going to play this clip through, and I'm just going to tell you what I noticed, okay? And it kind of got me wondering a little bit. So if the clip plays through, and we'll just pause it at the moment, then it kind of got my interest spiked. So if we pause here, we can see Healy ahead of James Ryan, and that to me got me interested. How did Healy get there so quick? He's in the front row, James Ryan is in the second row. And if we just go back quickly, actually Leinster score a try from this again, two phases later from creating a quick ball. But how did they create that quick ball? So we watch here and we're going to try and keep our eye on Healy as this ball comes away. Just keep your eye on the scrum, don't worry about the ball much. Just see Healy almost slips out from underneath the tight row or the, the tight head and he's on the move. Now his work rate is fantastic, but he's also scanning as he moves. Now the tight head is only coming into picture. Healy's already moving, he's probably four or five yards ahead. And just as we freeze here, you should be able to see the title is behind the scrum. He's probably out of the game, not in a position to be effective, whereas Healy is. Now, as players, we're very good at seeing the immediate. We see that he's in that position to carry. But the challenge for us now as players and coaches is, what did he do in the lead up to that? And as we watch games, we're going to try and see what did these players do? What little habits, what little movements? So he had the work rate, but he also had the, the game awareness and the scanning to get himself there. So for us guys as players, the challenge now is to kind of try and bring these things to our game. So when we watch the games and we try to thrive in chaos, we're looking at players' early movement. What they do initially out of their set piece or out of their out of their out of their stoppage, are they scanning on the move? So we're watching for players looking up, seeing what they see, and you know what 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 they're what they're looking for. If they do this, it gives them a really good chance to get into position early and link up with those players around them. If they can do all those things, then they're going to do the things that we see the immediate. So we're going to say, "Geez, Keen Healy's a great player to carry the ball." But what were those four things he did first to put himself in that position to carry? And they're the things that we're going to look for. So early movement, scanning on the move, getting into position early and linking up. And the more we do that, the more we're going to be in a position to make those good decisions. So finally, for us as players, here's the challenge. So when we're watching games, when we're sitting at home, when we go and watch our local clubs and when we go and watch Leinster, Connacht, Ulster and Munster, um, we're going to try and watch games with an inquisitive view. So firstly, we're going to say, how did that player get there? What did he do? We talked earlier on and, and, and the players were talking about those cheat lines. So how did that player get there? What was their work rate balance with their, with their game awareness? Why are they there? So what have they seen? Have they seen something in defence or have they seen something in attack? And then finally, have they visualised that situation to get themselves in that position to attack before? So it's not a surprise when they find themselves there. So finally, for me, guys, the challenge for you guys is watch the games and enjoy the games. But now when you see things happening that you would like to replicate, skip back a little bit and try and figure out not only who did the things, but also what did they do in the lead up to make it happen? That's all for me, Collie. Brilliant. Thanks, Connor. 
Um, and, and folks, if, if any of the videos aren't playing on your street screen just as smoothly as you would hope, we will be sending them out with the presentations as well. Uh, but just some fantastic stuff there, you know, really insightful and, and really hitting at the core of what we're talking about today, which is noticing and wondering. So noticing what, what the front rows are doing, wondering then, you know, how can you use that to go and improve what you're doing? Um, we have a few questions come in there. Look, we've just just after half one now. So if anyone needs to, to drop off, there's no problem. The questions will be covered within the recording. But for now, what we're going to do is we're going to throw out a question to each of our presenters uh, and get a little bit of feedback. Um, firstly, I'm going to come to yourself, Andy. Um, there's a really interesting question there, which you've answered within the um, the actual live event Q&A uh, in, in writing there. But if you could just maybe go into that, and I suppose we're talking about, you know, what, what are hookers going to do to add stability and balance in the scrum? Um, and, and if you just want to go through your answer there in a, in a wee bit of depth. Yeah, no problem, Colin. Yeah, so I guess it's not in it's not actually in law, but you've probably heard the phrase thrown around about the break foot. So the hookers break foot being forward. So some teams use that to, to help them with their balance, to ensure they're balanced. Um, so that would mean that they're, they're right foot forward just to hold that balance um, and that they're not leaning over the edge of the cliff, as I said earlier on. So um, World Rugby brought out the law after following the world uh, during the World Cup around axle loading. So um, that, that emphasis there on the hooker leaning head on shoulder. Um, so obviously safety is paramount, whatever level we're playing at. Um, so we don't want the hookers head on shoulder and all that force being exerted um, onto the opposition uh, hooker's shoulder because that's highly dangerous. Um, so you, you might have a bit of head on shoulder, but the key uh, for us as referees is the lean. That's the key word for me is lean. we don't want to see the lean forward because then the hookers uh, is supporting all their weight on their, on their head and neck, so which is extremely dangerous. So that's why at times you probably uh, look at games or watch games and you say, oh, the refs being pedantic around the pre-engage. That's exactly why, because we don't want that lean forward. So we, we, we need to have optimal space, which is ear to ear, which is which is where we want it. Brilliant. No, looking fascinating insight there and really hits at the core of, of why we have our referees, it's to be fair, but it's to be safe in, in what we're doing as well and, and a great insight. Um, so we'll come to Chloe next. Uh, look, I suppose we've had a few questions that have, that have come in just about, you know, if you, if you get into a bit of trouble, is there any important points to help you readjust your feet within the scrum? Um, and, and what can you do to kind of get back to a good position? Yeah, so I suppose that any time of the game you could be in, be in a lot of trouble you know you know you're kind of you're popped or you're kicking out um for me like i think the easiest way to do it is probably to try and resync that um the last thing we want to do is not chase our feet then because the minute you don't chase your feet you're going to be in trouble so i think the key is just to try sync try to get those feet back underneath you um and then the same just keeping your head up if you're a loose head start tucking it in under that tight head make sure that you're not popping out and then for a tight head i suppose if they are getting in underneath you it's about bringing that chest down on top of that loose head, try and make it as uncomfortable for them as possible. And then that might give you a little bit of a chance then just to kind of readjust your feet into that, you know, good shins parallel um, into that good angle again. But um, I say, I suppose the real key is try not to get into those positions in the first place. And then you won't have to worry about it because sometimes when you're in there, um, it's very hard to get back out. But just try sink, chase your feet again and see, can you get, get it back? Work with your hooker if, you know, both sides of it as well. Bring them with you if you are kind of in that tough space. Brilliant. No, look, and, and again, you know, fascinating insights. And for for those of us that, that haven't played front row, and um, you know, haven't been lucky enough to play front row, I suppose we'll say, um, you know, it, it really is like an absolute plethora of different um, technical skills that you need to be mindful of. And um, if we if we come to Connor next, um, just for for a quick question. Um, one that has, that has come in there, and like we've a number of coaches on on these webinars as well, um, and it's someone who who was a back and is now coaching forwards at a, at a youth age. So, is there one key cue that you would give, or one key thing that you would say is important for that coach to be giving to their players and, and asking them to notice in what they're doing? 
Um, yeah, I suppose I suppose as much as we can, I know it's pretty it's pretty a kind of a broad answer, but you kind of want them to try and play heads up and, and make a decision what they see. Um, you know, like I suppose in training, if we can create those little pictures for them, you know, whether it be offset and you know, using those little freeze things to kind of create a picture that the, the players can look up and actually see and understand and figure out for themselves. And as much as they can, if they see those pictures in training, it's a little bit easier to replicate in training. But I think we want the players to be, you know, empowered to look up, see what they see in front of them, um, you know, and make decisions based on that. And as long as they're making decisions based on what they see, they're, they're, they're going to be OK. Brilliant. No, look, a, a great point and, you know, equally applicable to all, all positions on the pitch and, and to actually go and and, and your overall game sense. Um, finally, the last question we're going to come to, and just before we we come to Ken on it, um, any of the questions that you know you, you've sent in, we will answer a, a selection of them, and they will be sent out as we as we send out the recordings as well. So even if we don't get to it immediately, we will have the opportunity to send some feedback as well. Um, so Ken, just on yourself, I suppose there, there's a, a double pronged question coming in. Uh, you know, first one being any neck exercises that you would suggest would be important to go and do as you're um, as you're developing as a front row, or is there any anything hints or tips you could go and do that? And then the second part of that question, just being, you know, in, in club rugby, it's it's a huge plus to play both sides of the scrum. Is there any have you any tips on going from tight head to loose head? I suppose just to, I, I, I'll work back on that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a massive advantage to, to play both sides because just for the simple reason, uh, you'd be able to understand exactly what, what, the, what your opposition is trying to do to you. Because if you play loose head, you generally have tight heads as Chloe was saying, trying to work down, put pressure on you. So if you've played at tight head, you'll understand exactly what, what, what the opposite is trying, the opposition is trying to, to do. I suppose moving across, I suppose it it's for me, it was always easier to kind of to go across to, to loose head as opposed to tie head because I suppose when people ask what the difference between a tie head and a loose head is it's generally about 150 grand a year for a sole reason. <laughs> it's they it's a prime position. But I guess for that type, it's just for me as a coach, the only way to do it is by practicing and learning and learn how, how it feels. As you can say, yeah, put your foot here, put your foot there, shoulder here, shoulder there. But it's just that you have to actually get in and do it to, 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 to understand how it feels. And you generally find your way through it. But yeah, it's, it's for, from loose to tight, being able to manage both shoulders from going from tight head to loose head. It's, it's exactly what Chloe was saying there earlier on about and Marcus about sinking that knee, keeping close to your to your hooker, and just trying to keep hips in, keep nice tight binds, you know, just to to keep that that kind of that tight between the 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 hooker and loose head. In terms of neck exercises, I wouldn't be one hundred percent qualified to be handing out information on neck exercises now, but uh an interesting one, most props, we do like to lie down on the couch, so it's even just to kind of head on the, the one of the, the arms on the couch and even just lifting lifting yourself up gently with your, just solely with your neck, not looking for you to get into a complete plank, lifting with the heels on one end, but just even sitting back on the couch head and just working that kind of that up and down and then even going to the side, working left and right as well. Um, I suppose there's there's a million and one kind of little harnesses that you can use, but again, what a, it's that would be a, an S, somebody qualified in S and C now, or even a physio club physio will be able to give you good exercises on it. As I say, I wouldn't be 100% qualified to be neck exercises, so. It is very but, important to look after that neck and back, all right. Yeah, look, absolutely key, and, and you know, safety is paramount in everything we do. Um, I suppose in wrapping up, and and you know, I want to say first of all, thank you to all our presenters and insights today. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do to to sit here and answer questions and 
and to be put on the spot like that. So I just want to say thanks to to Andrew, to Chloe, to Ken, and to Connor, and obviously to Marcus for for sharing his insights as well. Um, thanks to you for tuning in, um, and and make sure you stay tuned to the Irish Rugby website and our local provincial websites for all different tips different uh, videos and skills exercises that will help you develop your game in this current time. As I said at the beginning, everything we're doing um, as provincial administrators is to get us back on pitch uh, over the coming months when it is safe to do so. Um, so it, you know, now is your time to go and develop to, to be ready for then. Um, last thing I'll say is thank you very much for me um, and hopefully we'll see you next week for the rest of our webinars. Thanks folks.